So today I'm going to present some material from my second book project, which examines the way Russian writers from roughly the 1840s to the 1860s drew on contemporary scientific discourse in their attempts to uncover, understand, and represent reality. Um, I'm especially interested in those writers who have a reputation for being anti-scientific or non-scientific thinkers, um, like Gogol and Dostoevsky. Um, Dostoevsky, for example, the subject of my talk today, is most famous for his metaphysical strivings, for his attempts to sound the depths of the human soul, and for dramatizing what Joseph Frank calls the irreconcilable opposition between faith on the one hand and the empirical and rational on the other. For all his fascination with mystical other worlds, however, um, Dostoevsky was interested in this world first and foremost, in the empirically observable contemporaneous reality that he continually strove to capture in his fiction, um, hence his love of newspapers, factual details from which make their way into all his major novels. And like other 19th century European novelists, as studied by Gillian Beer, Cal Carolyn, and George Levine, among others, Dostoevsky's vision of that reality was conditioned by the scientific discourse of his day. Fortunately, because the topic is a very large one, I'm just one of several scholars trying to reassess Dostoevsky's attitudes toward the sciences. Others include Irina Paperna, um, uh, Anna Shore, especially Melissa Frazier, who's done excellent work in, in this area, uh, Alexei Davin, Michael Marsh Stalloway, um, and Brian Egdorf. I find this approach exciting because it sends us back to the proliferation of popular natural scientific, social scientific, um, and pseudoscientific texts that appeared in Russia during the mid 19th century with renewed attention to detail, no longer looking solely for the epistemological paradigms and strategies of representation that Dostoevsky rejected, but also for the ones he reimagined or adapted to his worldview. Um, in this lecture, I'm gonna try to show how productive such work can be. Um, I argue that it can shed new light even on such familiar novels as Crime and Punishment, and even on such familiar critical debates as the one about the novel's infamous epilogue. The quasi-scientific text that I will focus on today is Adolphe Kedele's influential 1835 statistical treatise um, on man and the development of his faculties or essays on social physics, which appeared in Russian translation in 1865 to widespread enthusiastic reviews. By the time Kedele's idea, by that time Kedele's ideas were already very well known in Russia. Henry Buckle's History of Civilization in England, which takes um, Kedele's work as its justification and starting point, was published in Russian in 1861 and again in 1863. By the mid 1860s, excitement about statistical analysis, its potential for revealing the underlying causes of social ills and pointing the way to their solution was reaching a fever pitch. One enthusiastic reviewer of Kedele declared in 1865, statistics, this is the philosopher's stone that antiquity searched for with such effort. Um, even the imperial government got on board. In 1864, it established the Central Statistical Committee to study geographical, sociological, and agricultural data from across the empire. Dostoevsky tackled his era's fascination with statistics head on. As many scholars before me have shown, Dostoevsky engages with the language and logic of what was then called moral statistics um, directly in his works, especially uh, his 1866 novel, Crime and Punishment. The novel contains several overt references statistics, which are all negatively marked. Um, and here I'll share my screen because I have a PowerPoint of some quotes from the talk. Um, 
okay, in one scene, um, Raskolnikov meditates on the danger of using words like statistics, like percentage, excuse me, to describe living, suffering human beings. Imagining the probable future of prostitution and destitution awaiting an intoxicated girl who had been raped, who he meets on the street, Raskolnikov muses, a certain percentage, they say, must go that way every year. Which way? To the devil, I suppose, so as to freshen up the rest and not get in their way. Percentage, what lovely words they use, so soothing, so scholarly. You hear a word like that and you wonder what on earth you were worrying about. Now, if it were a different word, you might feel a little less comfortable. Um, and I'm using Oliver Reddy's translation. Um, that's the second page number you'll see in, in the parentheses um, and also providing the uh, volume and page number for the PSS the 30 volume PSS. Um, a later reference to statistics, this one played for comic effect is just as overt. In that scene, the kindly but confused young socialist Lebeziatnikov recounts recommending some educational reading material to his stuffy and prudish provincial lady neighbors. Adolf Wagner's recently translated regularity in apparently volitional human action from the point of view of statistics, no doubt to their horror. Yet crime and punishment confronts the vogue for statistics in less overt ways as well, um, in ways that only became clear to me once I returned to Kedelet and the social aesthetic and moral philosophies that he and his followers promoted. Um, as I'll argue today, crime and punishment not only takes a stand against statistical determinism, the belief that large scale statistical regularities prove free will to be an illusion. Um, it also takes a stand against an entire network of statistically inflected ideas about the essence of goodness, the path to human perfectibility, and the nature of um, verisimilitude in art. And it does so not by adopting an anti-statistical position, not by rejecting statistical thinking and the probabilistic reasoning that underlies it, but instead by using statistical reasoning in a different way, a way that inverts Ketelet's system of values. Whereas Ketelet and his followers valorized the probable, the average, and the ordinary, crime and punishment suggests to the contrary, that it is not um, ordinary people and events, but statistical outliers, the odd, unlikely, and extraordinary that reveal the true nature of reality. It cultivates what I will call building on Yuri Lotman, a poetics of improbability, which operates on every level of the text from the methods of characterization to the structure of the plot, to the protagonist's improbable moral resurrection at the end. And I wanna pause here to give a brief roadmap of the rest of my talk. First, I'm gonna give some background on Ketelet's ideas, the thinkers they influenced and how Dostoevsky responded to them. Then I'm gonna to turn to the text of Crime and Punishment proper, examining how Dostoevsky's polemic with the statistical enthusiasts helped shape the novel's narrative structure. And finally, I'm going to look at the novel's epilogue and argue that many of its peculiarities are part and parcel of that larger polemic. So here's a picture of Ketelet just for fun. Um, First, some background on him and the movement he inspired. He was a Belgian astronomer with an enthusiasm for probability theory, um, and he became convinced that the mathematics of probability could be used not only in the study of celestial bodies, but in the study of social bodies as well. His logic went something like this. In order to track the movement of a planet, astronomers collect multiple um, observations of its coordinates. Each individual observation is subject to error, but if you take the average of many, um, you can predict the planet's future movements with great precision. So Ketelet thinks, what if you apply those same mathematical principles um, to 
different sets of data, like records of marriage, mortality, illness, and crime. Um, by comparing the average heights of children between the ages of one and 20, for example, you can see how growth rates tend to change as children get older. So um, at what ages they tend to grow the fastest, for example. By comparing the ages of violent criminals, you can determine when the propensity to crime reaches his peak. This was one thing Ketelet was most famous for. Um, discovering, it, although it, it, his discoveries were subject to criticism from other statisticians. Um, Ketelet dubbed his method social physics because he believed it would reveal the social and physiological laws that govern all human behavior from the width of a Scottish soldier's chest to the frequency with which women in their 60s marry men in their 20s. Kelly's work was hugely influential and sparked debates about the existence of free will, the causes of crime, and the justice of judicial punishment throughout Europe. Kelly was careful to remind his readers that the laws he had discovered only held true for large social groups and could be applied to individuals only within certain limits. But his fav favorite metaphors tended to uh, confuse matters um, for example, if we're all subject to social laws, how can we avoid conforming to them? As did his most famous declaration, such as the oft quoted, society prepares the crime and the guilty are only the instruments by which it is executed, which was quoted all throughout the Russian press um, in the 1860s. Moreover, Ketelet's devotees did not always draw the same distinctions between aggregates and individuals that he did. They often conflated the probable with the necessary, what might happen with what must happen in every single case. Henry Buckle, for example, used Ketelet's tables of crime statistics as grist for the mill of his own strict historical determinism. For him, they provide virtual proof that all human behavior, whether the behavior of individuals or the behavior of nations as a whole, is fundamentally predictable. And he makes this claim in really quite strong terms. Um, I'll read a long quote from the history of civilization in England. I'm reading the original English, but I have a little portion um, in Russian translation from the 1863 edition. Um, if, for example, I am intimately acquainted with the character of any person, I can frequently tell how he will act under some given circumstances. Should I fail in this prediction, I must ascribe my error not to the arbitrary and capricious freedom of his will, nor to any supernatural prearrangement, for of neither of these things have we the slightest proof. But I must be content to suppose either that I had been misinformed as to some of the circumstances in which he was placed, or else that I had not sufficiently studied the ordinary operations of his mind. Um, and in the 1863 Russian edition, this last phrase reads, Я недостаточно изучил обыкновенный ход его мысли. If, however, I were capable of correct reasoning, and if at the same time I had complete knowledge both of his disposition and of all the events by which he was surrounded, I should be able to foresee the line of conduct which, in consequence of these events, he would adopt. Um, Ketelet's uh, Russian popularizer, V.A. Zaitsev, made the case for determination uh, excuse me, determinism, with even more rhetorical flair. As he wrote in his 1863 article, Natural Science and Justice, man in all his actions, from the most important to the most insignificant, obeys statistical laws. Now, Dostoevsky never names Ketelet by name, um, and I've never found evidence that he read one of Ketelet's works all the way through. Um, but he certainly knew the basic outline of Kelly's ideas, as well as his famous um, tables of crime statistics, which were reproduced ad nauseum in the Russian press in the 1860s. The most popular was the one that showed um, the age, the 
most likely age uh, at which someone would commit a violent crime. So it shows the propensity to crime according to age. Um, with the age, according to Ketele, most likely to commit violent crimes at around 25. Moreover, he was intimately, Dostoevsky was intimately familiar with the work of Ketele's followers. He owned his own copy of Buckle's History of Civilization in England and overtly polemicized it in Notes from Underground when the underground man questions Buckle's assertion that the more civilized people are, the less bloodthirsty they become. I want to pause for a moment on Dostoevsky's attitude towards Buckle because it's actually more nuanced than it might seem at first glance. As we know, Buckle's strict determinism was an anathema to Dostoevsky, but that doesn't mean that Dostoevsky uh, disavowed every single one of Buckle's ideas. In 1864, the same year that he published Notes from Underground, he drafted an open letter to his critics, which grants many of Buckle's major points. Um, and that's this quote coming up here. We are adherents of the native soil philosophy, first of all, because we believe that nothing on earth happens abstractly outside of real historical life or discontinuously. If one can agree with Buckle about the influence of the climate and other things on people's development and sphere of understanding, then it is also clear that when these conditions cease, the understanding of the peoples who developed under these conditions will cease as well. Soil that has been cultivated changes the climate, the population, railroads shrink distances, and so on. If it is really is true that the Mohammedan peoples could not be anything but Mohammedans, then it is also true that they could not convert to Christianity as a whole people before their time, but only as individual personalities. Now they are all converting. Um, I've quoted this rather obscure passage because I believe it demonstrates both some of the nuances of Dostoevsky's response to Buckle um, and what makes that response problematic. In the quote, Dostoevsky concedes that external forces like climate and soil quality may shape the development of peoples as a whole. However, he insists that they do not determine the behavior of individual personalities who can and do buck historical norms. And Dostoevsky hints that while the actions of these individual personalities may be statistically insignificant, they are nevertheless highly revealing, at least for those with eyes to see. He's strongly applying here that the singular conversions are the first signs of a mass turn towards Christianity that is yet to come. The passage begins to demonstrate for me why Dostoevsky finds statistical anomalies so appealing. By granting predictive power to these singular events, Dostoevsky can have his cake and eat it too. He can insist on the moral freedom of individuals to make choices that contravene larger social, environmental, and historical forces, but he can also interpret their eccentric actions as harbingers of a divinely inspired Christian future, what he would later call the great general harmony, ultimate brotherly accord of all tribes through the law of Christ's gospel. In other words, granting predictive power to statistical outliers allows Dostoevsky to circumvent the age-old conflict between free will and greater divine plan by turning the free actions of individuals into evidence of said divine plan. And it also allows him to pick and choose his anomalies to highlight the ones that seem to confirm his own worldview um, and his own vision of the future and to ignore the massive evidence that does not. Ketele and his followers provided more than just a sounding board for Dostoevsky's ideas about human volition and historical change, however. They provided a sounding board for his evolving moral and aesthetic principles as well. As I will discuss next, the statistical enthusiasts shared Dostoevsky's questions about goodness, human perfectibility, and artistic verisimilitude, 
although they and Dostoevsky generally answered those questions in very different ways. For Ketelet, the statistically average man was not only a hypothetical being whose movements could be tracked in lieu of a planet, he was the human ideal. Again and again, Ketelet argues that the closer a person becomes, approaches the average, whether in height, weight, or degree of bravery, the closer he becomes to what is good and beautiful. All significant deviations from the mean, by contrast, constitute deformity and disease. In a passage that reads very much like Raskolnikov's extraordinary man theory, but with the values inverted, Ketelet emphasizes how much importance I attach to the consideration of limits, which seem to me of two kinds, ordinary or natural, and extraordinary or beyond the natural. The first limits comprise within them the qualities which deviate more or less from the mean without attracting attention by excess on one side or the other. When the deviations become greater, they constitute the extraordinary class, having itself its limits on the outer verge of which are things preternatural or monstrosities. According to Ketelet, any extraordinary human quality which deviates too far from the average becomes increasingly ugly, unnatural, and even monstrous. And this holds not only for physical characteristics, but for moral characteristics as well. Um, as Ketelet suggests in On the Social System and the Laws that Regulate It, which was translated into Russian in 1866, um, and uh, it also included a chapter titled Crime and Punishment, Prestupienie i Nakazania. Um, Kevlet argues, in medio virtus is a universal truth. Moral instincts like generosity are only as good as they are. Moderate, too much leads to profligacy, too little leads to avarice. Kevlet um, allocates the average man a central role in the arts as well. Although he acknowledges that artists are necessarily drawn to variety and particularity, he insists that the varieties and particularities they depict should always fall well within the natural limits of what he called the ordinary. Staying within these probabilistic limits, maybe within one standard deviation of the mean, is both the key to beauty and the key to verisimilitude in art. As Ketelet puts it, the necessity of veracity in faithfully representing the physiognomy, the habits, and the manners of people at different epochs has at all times led artists and literary men to seize among the individuals whom they observed the characteristic traits of the period in which they lived, or in other words, to come as near the average as possible. So for Kevlet, veracity in art requires statistically average subject matter. What I find so useful about returning to Ketelet is that it demonstrates just how closely inter interconnected and even inseparable discussions about human volition, morality, beauty, um, and artistic truth could be in mid 19th century works of social statistics. Once you've read Ketelet, it makes sense, um, starts to make sense that crime and punishment traces those same interconnections as well. Um, I'm not trying to make a case for direct influence. Dostoevsky may not have known Ketelet's theory of art at all. It appears in um, a portion of On the Development of Man that in 1866 had yet to be translated into Russian. Um, but Dostoevsky certainly knew theories like it. As Morris Lee has shown, by the mid-19th century, literary critics all over Europe were declaring fictions subject to statistical laws and demanding that literary plot lines adhere to the calculus of probabilities. Um, and from the very beginning of his post-Siberian career, Dostoevsky wanted to do something different. In 1858, he told his brother that he had written a sharp polemical article titled On the Statistical School in Russian Literature. Um, and although the article has not survived, Dostoevsky's later writings on realism 
hint at what it might have contained. In an 1869 letter, which has since become famous and which I'm sure you are all very familiar with, um, he explained, I have my own particular view of reality in art and that which the majority calls almost fantastic and exceptional sometimes contains the very essence of reality for me. The everydayness of phenomena and a requisite view of them is not yet realism in my opinion, but even its opposite. In every issue of the newspapers, we come upon an account of the most real facts and the strangest ones. For our writers, they are fantastic and they don't engage with them, but they are reality because they are facts. For Dostoevsky, commonplace events and the common sense consensus view of said events actually reveal very little about contemporary reality. On the contrary, it is the statistically infrequent events that reveal the most about the times in which they occur and point the way towards the future, um, like those sporadic conversions to Christianity that Dostoevsky highlights in the passage I quoted earlier. In Crime and Punishment, Dostoevsky realizes his exceptional view of reality more fully than ever before. First, he fills the novel with extraordinary characters who are nevertheless representative of Russian life as Dostoevsky understood it. The saintly prostitute Sonia is extremely petite and unusually young looking with a face described as terribly thin, terribly pale, quite irregular and somehow sharp. She is a statistical outlier, not just physically, but morally as well. Her extreme generosity, limitless um, compassion, in, described as insatiable compassion, rebuke Ketelet's beloved principle in Medio Virtus. The remarkably good looking Raskolnikov is also far from average in several important ways. His behavior after the murder, especially the careless way he treats the goods he has stolen, strikes investigators as highly unusual, almost impossible to believe. It, quote, seemed improbable, pakazalis ni verayatnim, to them that he never even looked to see how much money was in the pawnbroker's purse. This is one of many things that finally convinced them that Raskolnikov, quote, did not re resemble an ordinary Abuknavyanova murderer, felon, and robin. This was something else. Of course, Raskolnikov wants to seem out of the ordinary. He kills in order to prove himself an extraordinary Nebuknavyanova man who dares to break the law and fears no consequences. Ironically, however, Raskolnikov's theory that a small percentage of the world's population has the moral right to commit crime is one of the most ordinary things about him. A mashup of popular ideas taken from statistics, utilitarianism, social Darwinism, and the writings of Napoleon III, it is hardly original. According to Razumihin, the idea isn't new and, quote, resembles everything we've read and heard a thousand times before. The murders that Raskolnikov's theory drives him to commit are surprisingly average as well. According to Ketelet's calculations, the greatest number of violent crimes take place during the summer months. Raskolnikov kills in July and the propensity to crime reaches its height at around the age of 25. Raskolnikov is 23. Raskolnikov is thus a fairly likely killer in some ways. Um, it's what he does after the murder that strikes everyone as so unusual. And here for me um, is another benefit of returning to Ketelet. It, um, can help explain why one familiar reading of Crime and Punishment, um, in my opinion, misses the mark. According to this reading, um, which has been proposed by Gary Saul Morrison, for example, Raskolnikov's big mistake is that he desires extraordinariness, that he does not recognize the virtue of small acts of prosaic goodness or ordinary decency guided by neither theory nor religious visions, but by practical reason. Um, 
As I've been trying to show, however, Dostoevsky values the extraordinary just as much as his protagonist does. He simply suggests that Raskolnikov's truly extraordinary qualities are not the, one, the ones that Raskolnikov thinks they are. In other words, Raskolnikov does not need to let go of his desire for extraordinariness in order to be redeemed. Rather, he needs to recognize and begin to cultivate the qualities that truly set him apart. His heightened generosity and capacity for compassion. Um, that's what will let Raskolnikov step out of the ranks of the bloodthirsty majority and become one of the pure and chosen minority, the few survivors of the plague that he dreams about in the epilogue, um, which is another dream about an extraordinary minority who um, triumphs over the, uh, they sort of herd of everyone else. Choosing extraordinary heroes is one way that Dostoevsky resists the aesthetics of the probable and the average. Building the novel's plot around a series of strange, almost miraculous coincidences is another. The coincidences are so plentiful that somehow even seen them as an artistic flaw. Ernest Simmons writes, Coincidence is an ever-present trap for weary novelists, and in this respect, Dostoevsky nodded rather frequently in Crime and Punishment. It is perhaps the principal artistic blemish in the work. Coincidence, of course, may be justifiable in a novel, for it is a legitimate part of the pattern of reality. In real life, however, coincidental happenings do not violate the laws of probability. And in fiction, our credibility is forfeited if coincidence is overworked. The novel contains dozens of such violations. Lusion just happens to live in the same apartment as the Marmoladovs. Svidrigailov just happens to overhear Sonia talking to Raskolnikov on the street and then discovers that he just happens to live next door to her. Raskolnikov just happens to hear Lizaveta saying what time she will be out of the house, giving him the opportunity to kill. And when he cannot access his chosen murder weapon, another axe just happens to be waiting for him in the courtyard. Robert Belknap points out that none of these events is strictly impossible, yet they are highly improbable. In fact, I would argue that Dostoevsky includes them in his novel, not in spite of the fact, but rather because they violate the laws of probability, the statistical norms that Catelet and his devotees believed govern human life, a thesis that Dostoevsky rejects. Doing so allows Dostoevsky to depict a world that is both empirically possible and bubbling with potentiality, a world in which the strangest and most unexpected things can happen. Indeed, in Dostoevsky's fiction, the unexpected rules. For the past hundred years, and I can't believe it's been a hundred years, critics have been discussing how often the word suddenly punctuates Dostoevsky's works. Um, according to Vladimir Toporov, for example, the word suddenly appears around 560 times in crime and punishment alone. Yuri Lotman has even argued that Dostoevsky's storylines operate according to a law of least probability. Quote, in a text by Dostoevsky, the thing least expected by the reader, that is to say, the least expected both according to the laws of life, experience, and literary constructs, turns out to be the one thing possible for the author. In a whole series of cases, predictability is in fact present only in reverse. Episodes follow each other in not the most probable, but the most improbable order. Lotman demonstrates his point with a sequence from Demons, but several scenes from Crime and Punishment would work just as well. One which combines references to criminology and statistics with an intrusion of the unexpected merits special attention. In this scene, the lead investigator Porfiry Petrovich works on Raskolnikov's nerves. He hints that he already knows who the killer is, but is in no hurry to make an arrest 
because he knows that some criminals, i.e. ones like Raskolnikov, would actually prefer to get caught. After a few examples of this psychological phenomenon, Porfiry Petrovich makes the following aside. These are all particular cases, I'll agree. The case I've just described really is a particular one, sir. But here's what we need to bear in mind, dear sweet Radion Ramanovich. The typical case, the very same one according to which all the legal forms and principles are tailored and calculated and written up in books, simply does not exist, sir, by virtue of the fact that each and every deed each and every, for want of a better example, crime, just as soon as it occurs in reality, immediately becomes a particular case, sir. In fact, sometimes it's like nothing that's ever gone before. According to Porfiry Petrovich, the average typical case has little to teach investigators because each and every criminal and each and every crime is particular and unique unto itself. Instead of assuming that a murderer will act according to a set of generalizable principles, the investigator must strive to understand the unique psychological laws governing the criminal's singular personality. And Porfiry Petrovich implies he has cracked Raskolnikov's code. Someone like him, quote, won't run away psychologically. Heh, heh, heh. What a lovely little phrase. The laws of nature won't let him run away even if he did have somewhere to go. Perhaps Porfiry Petrovich truly believes that Raskolnikov's behavior is controlled by some sort of internal psychological law, or perhaps he is just trying to intimidate um, his suspect. Later, he warns Raskolnikov to take everything he says with a grain of salt. As for Dostoevsky, for, however, he hints that people sometimes behave according to no law whatsoever. The chapter ends when a strange incident occurred, something so very unexpected in the ordinary course of events, um, that there was simply no way either Raskolnikov or Perfiri Petrovich could ever have anticipated. Um, and note the... Uh, the echo of buckle here. Another suspect, the painter Mikolka, suddenly confesses to the murder, ruining Porfiry Petrovich's plans and giving Raskolnikov an unexpected reprieve from the interrogation. Here, Dostoevsky uses his improbable poetics to make a philosophical point. Individual human actions are not as easy to predict as thinkers like. Kedele imagine, or Porfiry Petrovich claims. Porfiry may have studied Mikulka's personality in depth, but even he cannot always anticipate what the painter will do next. Um, I'll stop share now. Now you can see my face. Um, Dostoevsky revels in events like Mikulka's unexpected but perfectly timed convention confession that are so improbable, so out of the ordinary, that they border on the miraculous. The narrator of The Gambler describes his story in these terms, quote, certain events occurred with me that were almost miraculous. In any case, that's how I continue to see them. Although from another point of view, especially judging by the whirlwind in which I was turning at the time, they were perhaps merely not entirely ordinary. The plot of Crime and Punishment, which Dostoevsky wrote at the same time, plays out in that same improbable zone where the not quite ordinary approaches the miraculous. It's no wonder that Raskolnikov reads so many of the coincidences that befall him as signs of divine or demonic intervention. When he unexpectedly stumbles on an unattended axe in the courtyard, he blames the devil. When he happens upon Svidrigailov in a tavern, he calls their meeting a strange chance, but does not deny that in his heart of hearts, he believes it to be a miracle. Like all the miracles in Dostoevsky's fiction, however, this one has a potentially rational explanation. According to Svidrigailov, 
the their meeting was no miracle at all. Raskolnikov had forgotten that Svidrigailov told him that he would be in precisely this tavern at precisely this time. According to Svidrigailov, the address must have imprinted itself mechanically in Raskolnikov's memory. And without realizing what he was doing, Raskolnikov mechanically walked straight there. In general, highly improbable events like Raskolnikov's unexpected meeting with Svidrigailov can be explained in more than one way. They can be read as the workings of natural law, the result of random chance, or even as signs of covert divine or demonic intervention, which is, I think, precisely why Dostoevsky is so fascinated by them. They allow him to bridge the irreconcilable opposition between faith on the one hand and the empirical and rational on the other. Highly improbable events suggest that something very much like a miracle can happen in real life. They suggest that the miraculous need not emanate from some supernatural sphere, but instead, to quote Lotman again, can be discovered in the thick of life itself. And interestingly, um, there's a very long tradition in Western European philosophy um, going back to the 18th century of talking about miracles in terms of probability um, and classing them in a, sometimes classing them in a larger category of um, extraordinary facts um, and then debating, you know, whether they're actually impossible or just highly, highly improbable. Um, I want to conclude my talk by considering the part of crime as punishment that has struck generations of readers as being the most improbable of all. The epilogue, when after nine unrepentant months in prison, Raskolnikov undergoes an unexpected change of heart. He's sitting on a log overlooking the river when Sonia suddenly Vdruk appears by his side, then just as suddenly Vdruk Quote, something swept him up and hurled him at her feet. There and then in that same instant, Sonia understands what has happened, that he loved her, loved her endlessly, and the moment had finally come. Raskolnikov feels the change inside himself as well. Quote, he'd been resurrected and he knew it. He felt it full with his whole renewed being. Um, not all critics, as we know, have found Raskolnikov's resurrection convincing. Bakhtin deems the epilogue conventionally monologic, a rare moment when Dostoevsky's own Christian ideology threatens to overwhelm the polyphonic artistic structure of the novel as a whole. Ernest Simmons declares Raskolnikov's transformation utterly unbelievable, quote, neither artistically palatable nor psychologically sound. Konstantin Machulski argues that even Dostoevsky did not believe in Raskolnikov's conversion, which he reads as the author's half-hearted attempt to appease a conservative readership. According to Machulski, quote, we know Raskolnikov too well to believe this pious lie. I want to suggest to the contrary that Raskolnikov's resurrection does accord with the novel's larger aesthetic structure, not in spite of its improbability, but precisely because of it. For the entire novel, we have watched Raskolnikov swing back and forth like a pendulum of a tightly wound clock between his impulses toward pride, violence, and solitude on the one hand, and towards human community on the other. If the past predicts the future, um, he should keep moving back and forth between these poles indefinitely until he finally runs out of energy and stops moving altogether. Even his last name, famously built on the root of the Russian word for schism, suggests that this divided state is fundamental to his identity and unlikely to ever change. But what if Raskolnikov's transformation is meant to seem unlikely, a truly extraordinary event? What if it is not supposed to be artistically palatable, at least not to readers who equate probability with artistic truth? When Machulski argues that we know Raskolnikov too well to believe in his transformation, his logic approaches buckles. 
if we have complete knowledge of a man's character and the ordinary operations of his mind, we should be able to foresee everything he will or will not do. But Dostoevsky has spent the entire novel trying to convince us that this is not true, that people sometimes behave improbably, and that individual human actions are extremely difficult to predict. In that sense, Raskolnikov's improbable conversion is perfectly in harmony with the rest of the novel, not to mention Dostoevsky's entire aesthetic project, which habitually grants signifying power to statistical outliers. Yet it's equally important for Dostoevsky's project that Raskolnikov's resurrection seem plausible, that it remain within the limits of possibility, and the readers believe that something like it could happen in real life, even if it probably wouldn't. After all, this is still a realist novel, albeit an unusual type of realism. Um, Dostoevsky takes pains to establish the possibility of Raskolnikov's change of heart from page one by en emphasizing his inner conflict. Um, but Dostoevsky also takes pains to establish the possibility that Raskolnikov could go another way as well. Porfiry Petrovich, for example, considers the possibility that God has prepared a life for Raskolnikov, which he will find while he repents. But Porfiry Petrovich also weighs the chances that Raskolnikov's potential will pass like smoke and even that he will commit suicide before confessing. Svidrigailov identifies yet another road that Raskolnikov might go down, declaring that, quote, he could be a proper rascal with time once all this silliness is knocked out of him. Raskolnikov's future conversion thus is re represented as a possibility rather than an inevitability a plausibility rather than a necessity. If it seemed too inevitable, um, if it became too easy to predict, it would just end up reaffirming Buckle's deterministic logic. Dostoevsky tries to make Raskolnikov's resurrection seem plausible in another way as well by emphasizing its incompleteness. Um, if Raskolnikov's entire personality were to transform instantaneously, completely and irrevocably, it might indeed strike readers as an impossibility, a pious lie, but it doesn't. Instead, Dostoevsky balances out references to the instantaneousness of Raskolnikov's transformation with references to his enduring personal weaknesses. Even after his Riverside conversion, for example, Raskolnikov experiences no special renewal of re religious faith. He mechanically picks up the copy of the New Testament that Sonia has given him, but he puts it down again without opening it. Worse, he continues to display little remorse for the murders he committed. To the contrary, he mentally disowns his past. As we learn, quote, everything, even his crime, even his sentence and exile seem to him now in the first surge somehow alien and strange as if they hadn't even happened to him. But Raskolnikov is wrong about this. He has not become an entirely new person and he'll not be able to escape his past as easily as he imagines. The narrator informs us that Raskolnikov did not even know that his new life was not being given to him for free, that it would still cost him dear, and that it would have to be paid for with a great future deed. Um, characteristically, though, the narrator doesn't tell us what that great future deed might be. Like almost all the details of Raskolnikov's future life, this one remains hazy and undetermined. Um, take the novel's famous last lines. But here a new story begins, the story of a man's gradual renewal and gradual rebirth of his gradual crossing from one world to another, his acquaintance with a new as yet unknown reality. The final lines assure us that one way or another, Raskolnikov will eventually be re reborn, that he will reach this new and unknown reality, whatever that may be. But they do not mark out the path he will take to get there, and they do not guarantee that his path will be a straight one. They allow for a degree of continued unpredictability for the possibility that Raskolnikov's life will be punctured by still more improbable and extraordinary events. So if the ending of crime and punishment subverts reader expectations in some ways, in others it does not. In one way at least it is paradoxically predictable 
After all, this is not the first, not the second, but the 560th sudden turn of events in the novel. By this time point, we should be expecting the unexpected. Robert Belknap has noted another way in which the ending hardly surprises. It concludes with the uniting in love um, of a beautiful young man and an attractive young woman. And what could be more expected of a novelistic ending than that? Like so much of Dostoevsky's fiction, the epilogue to crime and punishment combines the expected with the unexpected, the gradual with the sudden, the literarily conventional with the anomalous. It exists in the liminal realm Dostoevsky likes best, the realm of the improbable, the almost miraculous, the statistically unlikely, but scientifically possible. Thank you.